In July 1862, remember we saw last time, Congress is passing the Confiscation Act. They're abolishing slavery in Washington, D.C. And they also repeal the whites-only portion of the militia law. They repeal the ban on blacks. Now, then they say the president, but they pass the buck to Lincoln. Now, of course, he is the commander-in-chief. The president may employ blacks in any way he desires. This is not authorizing black soldiers, but telling Lincoln he can do it if he wants, and there's no longer a law on the books barring blacks from service. Um, and by the fall of, eight, fall and, uh, of 1862, the first steps toward enrolling African Americans are taking place. Ben Butler, who always seems to pop up at the, where things are happening, is now in command in New Orleans. And he says, well, there's a free black militia here. I'm going to put them in the Union. I'm going to enroll them in the Union Army. These are guys who have some military experience. So he brings this so-called Native Guard into, he says, I'm not arming slaves. These are free men. And I'm just putting them under the, you know, as a unit in the Union Army. Now, in practice, he didn't ask, are you free or not? Anyone who turned up, Butler stuck in his unit. Um, and uh, he, he didn't worry about whether they were really free or slave. He needed men. Uh, most of them were fairly light-skinned. They were the products of unions between, Fr or descended from French men and slave women. They didn't look all that black, most of them. He said, Butler wrote to Secretary of War Stanton, I will soon have a regiment of a thousand men, the darkest of whom is about the complexion of the late Daniel Webster. Webster was slightly dark, but, you know, not, all right. Um, at the same time, things were going on without any authorization. Out in Kansas, James Lane, General James Lane, began enrolling, he was fighting guerrillas in, in, you know, in Missouri. Remember, there was this kind of inner civil war in Missouri, very difficult to deal with. Lane begins recruiting black men from Missouri and Kansas into units that are fighting. He also actually recruits some Native Americans. So Lane's forces are probably the most integrated group in the whole Civil War. Whites, blacks, Native Americans fighting. And they're the first African Americans to see combat of a sort. They're fight it's not really pitched battles, but going after guerrilla groups and bandits and that sort of thing. That's going on. Nobody says anything. It's happening. It's not authorized. Lincoln doesn't say, stop it or do it. It just is happening. On the other hand, at the same time, in South Carolina, General um, David Hunter, an abolitionist general, says, I'm enrolling black soldiers. I need every man I can get. And Lincoln stops him. He says, no, because Hunter announces this publicly. And Lincoln says, no, you can't do it. And basically, Lincoln feels if you do it quietly, that's cool. But it's not a public... It's not the policy of the government yet, so he disbands. He orders Hunter's unit um, disbanded. Well, as, as the fall goes along, there's more and more pressure uh, for using black soldiers. In, um, in September, remember when McClellan had, in, uh, when Lee had invaded Maryland, leading to the Battle of Antietam, at the same time there's a Confederate thrust in the West threatening the city of Cincinnati, just over the Ohio River, from Kentucky, and, black, and black, Cincinnati had a pretty significant free black population, and the local uh, defense forces start enrolling blacks in the defense. Again, they got to stand up against this Confederate army that's heading there and uh, to work on the fortifications to do things. So they do a pretty good job, and this gets widely publicized. And finally, in, um, in late in September, um, Secretary of War Stanton authorizes the enlistment of black soldiers in the Sea Islands. Remember, again, Lincoln says nothing about it, but they use Hunter's disbanded troops as the core of what will become the first South Carolina volunteers. That's what it's called, the black unit. The first South Carolina volunteers. Again, a South Carolina unit. There hadn't been any South Carolina volunteers for the Union Army before that. So uh, this is the first one, right? First South Carolina volunteer unit under the command of Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Now, you may remember Higginson. He was one of the so-called Secret Six abolitionists who had aided John Brown. 
not fighting at Harper's Ferry, but he was one of those guys who raised money for John Brown and met with him. And he was a pretty, he was a very vehement radical abolitionist. He came down, he became the commander of the first South Carolina volunteers. And by November, they were actually engaged in marauding expeditions off the islands into the coast, coastal area of South Carolina. And they were officially enrolled as a unit of the Union Army in early uh, 1863. And for a, long, for a good while, a lot of national attention focuses on the first South Carolina volunteers. Because remember, the Sea Islands are, everything in the Sea Islands is taking place under this microscope. Um, there's a lot of, as we'll see, well, after the break, there's a lot of teachers and other people from the North go down there to assist the transition from slavery to freedom. There are reporters from all sorts of Northern newspapers down there seeing what happens to these slaves once they become free. And they are following the progress of Higginson's unit also. Now, Higginson wrote a very famous book later on, Army Life in a Black Regiment, a memoir of his career as commander of the um, South Carolina Volunteers. And he wrote in there, he said, there can be no doubt that for many months the fate of the whole movement for colored troops rested on the behavior of this one regiment, a mutiny, extensive desertion, an act of severe discipline, a bull run panic, a simple defeat might have blasted the whole movement for arming the blacks. Now Higginson, like many, many other white officers, came with some kinds of prejudices or what you might call what, what uh, George Fredrickson, the historian, called romantic racialism. Certain I idea, the idea, it's, it's not exactly the same thing as racism. Racialism, I hate to make this a semantic thing, Higginson believed in political equality, civil equality, social equality, um, but he also believed that each race has certain inborn characteristics. It's not even a question that one being superior or not, that just that's how the world is divided up into groups called races, each of them with certain characteristics. And what are the characteristics of blacks? They're kind of docile and they're religious, they're happy-go-lucky, they're gay, he says, and lovable, and they like to sing and dance a lot at night. Um, so there's obviously a lot of prejudice there, but he does, so he comes with these assumptions but he quickly concludes that these recruits can be made into efficient, effective soldiers. Um, and, but he found a lot of obstacles. First of all, he found these men who were from the Sea Island of South Carolina quite unhealthy. They looked very strong, but in fact their diets as slaves had been so poor, so deficient in vitamins and other that they lacked stamina, they were susceptible to disease, uh, the slave diet had not given them a lot of endurance, which they needed, and they, they had to be given better food and all this kind of thing. Um, one other officer wrote, he said, the average plantation Negro had about as much of the soldier to be seen in him as there was of an angel in Michelangelo's block of marble before he applied his chisel. But after drilling the plantation manners the awkward bowing and scraping were exchanged for an upright form and the gentlemanly address of the soldier. So they could be trained to become soldiers.